and uh, joins us via telephone, I presume, from Charleston. Mike, good morning to you, sir. How you doing? Hey, good morning. And, uh, yeah, tough morning uh, here at the state capitol. About three inches of snow. The roads are still pretty snow-covered. And uh, I say uh, on mornings like this, thank goodness for my pickup truck. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, they, they, it gets me to work safely, and uh, but I'm pretty careful on the roads. I appreciate that. Just don't drive that thing 80 miles an hour because <laughs> you're in a pickup truck, Mike. <laughs> no, no. I need better tires if I'm going to do that. You know, this, <laughs> this pickup truck now has about 250,000 miles on it. Good. And during the course of this campaign, I suspect we'll add another 250,000 to it. What are you driving? What is it? So it's an F-150 2013 yep. uh, with those back the blue license plate, that, that back the blue license plate. And uh, it's back the blue 001. So, so if you see me driving in a, if you see somebody driving in a really old F-150 with a back the blue license plate, it's probably Mike Stewart. But, uh, <laughs> I do appreciate the time this morning. Uh, it's, it's a rough morning, but uh, hopefully folks are out of their home. Or driving safely to work right now. You are a candidate for attorney general in the state as well. And earlier in an interview uh, about two weeks ago with Craig Blair, he made mention of the fact, the Senate president, that he wanted to bring the death penalty into West Virginia, uh, specifically for fentanyl uh, drug distribution. You've talked about bringing the death penalty to West Virginia as well, Mike. Can you give us some details? Yeah, well, first, even before I want to uh, talk about that, I just want to congratulate President Trump on just a remarkable victory last night, winning 99 of 99 counties, historic victory. Uh, but this is, gonna, this is a big year, 2024. Yeah, Mike, and, uh, in, re- yeah. in regards to that victory, I heard this morning that he won demographic groups that he previously lost in Iowa in his last run for president. A lot of those folks who had gone – to Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz came back to Trump this time. It's 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 hard to talk enough about the remarkable size of this victory. I know a lot of folks last night were talking about the, the race for number two. I'll be honest. I don't think there's a race for number two or three or four. This race is over. We need to coalesce behind the nominee. Uh, a lot of Americans are really, really frustrated with what they see as just a a horrendous White House, perhaps the worst in our history, uh, rising inflation, a border out of control, international conflicts out the wazoo. Uh, We had good, stable, strong, definitive leadership in President Trump, and I think it's a foregone conclusion he'll be our nominee, and I believe he'll be the next president. Mike, if asked to be, if, if Donald Trump is back in the White House and you're asked to be a U.S. attorney once again for the district, would you accept that position if you were elected as attorney general? Well, the problem with that is I think I'm going to be the attorney general, and I think I can do more for our country. This is the one thing that I want folks to understand as they look at this race. I mean, a proven prosecutor, former U.S. attorney, the personal pick of Donald Trump for that spot, working with the law enforcement every day really committed to that role. But it's the role of attorney generals across our country, across the the nation, that play the greatest role in fighting against that federal bureaucracy and those unelected bureaucrats that want to rain down and turn off the coal industry and shut down the gas industry and tell us we can't use gas stoves and that uh, we're not allowed to have firearms anymore. It's state attorney generals, and frankly, I think I could play a bigger role in fighting with the president and a new administration in terms of pushing back against that bureaucratic state than I could even as U.S. attorney. I think I can play a national role in that respect, and I'm pretty excited by that prospect. Let's talk about capital punishment in West Virginia and uh, what you would like to see and whom would that uh, punishment apply? Yeah, so I think what we're going to end up with in this session, I believe, are two separate death penalty bills. And I don't come to the death penalty lightly. It's that background of serving as a U.S. attorney and uh, being up close, seeing some of these bad guys, and also watching the news stories. We just saw in Martinsburg, uh, Abe Bean and uh, Caden Spessler, uh, state troopers that were executing just a misdemeanor warrant. Uh, that were shot uh, to the nick of their lives. And uh, let me say this to all your listeners, and and if if Trooper Bain and Trooper Spessert and his family are are listening, 
my prayers, my family continues to keep you in our prayers. Uh, but we can't tolerate these types of actions against first responders. My bill is titled the First Responder Defense and Justice Act. It's very, very simple. And I, I don't think we should be rolling out the death penalty for every crime willy-nilly. But we need to be absolutely clear that what happened to Trooper Bean and Trooper Spessert, and uh, I'll give you another example, Sergeant Corey Maynard. I, I carry a wallet in my pocket filled with the faces of the victims of the opiate crisis uh, that were victims during my term as U.S. attorney, who I've gotten in other moms and dads too well. But I carry one other thing in that wallet, and it's a sticker of Sergeant Corey Maynard, who was a state trooper that went to an ordinary call on an ordinary day. And I put ordinary in quotes because there is no ordinary day for first responders. They have no idea what they're going to walk into. And he went down to Mingo County, and he was ambushed, literally ambushed in the line of duty, shot multiple times. And as he lay bleeding out on the ground, uh, this uh, this fiend took the butt of his rifle and walked up to Sergeant uh, Maynard, true hero, and started beating on him with the butt of that rifle, cracking his skull open, of course leading to his death. I've seen the video. Uh, it is uh, incredibly emotional. But this is and, – and, and that guy stands uh, charged with first-degree murder, uh, but – this guy should be facing the death penalty. And uh, my bill is specifically with respect to first responders in the line of duty. If they're targeted leading to death, I think most West Virginians, as I speak about this issue across West Virginia, believe the death penalty should be on the table. Mike, has anybody attempted in the, in the time you've been in the legislature to craft legislation in regards to capital punishment, either in the Senate or the House? Well, they have, and for a long time, uh, Delegate Overington. Uh, oh, I know he did. Right. I know he yeah. did every year he was in, but then when the Republicans took the majority and he had a chance to actually get it passed, he never introduced it. And when I asked him why, he said he, he led me to believe it was because leadership didn't want it. So so here's been my view on leadership, and I serve in the state Senate. I, I was U.S. Attorney, now I'm, I'm in the state Senate. I, I look at every issue and every bill. I... I, I uh, I want to agree and be as supportive as I can with leadership, but I see my role as representing my constituents and the people of West Virginia. It's what I did as U.S. attorney, trying to make sure our streets are safe, law enforcement has the tools they need to do their jobs. This is a bill whose time has come. I was fortunate when I was U.S. attorney that, that during that nearly four-year period of time, we didn't have any officers or first responders killed in the line of duty. But across this nation, the defund police efforts, uh, these nitwits across our country that assault police officers at uh, their will and pleasure, that seem to pay no penalty for it, uh, this is very dangerous for first responders who are out in the line of duty. And I'll point out, these are incredible public servants. I know that I hear from folks that say that the police aren't great, and they'll point to that one example out of a thousand where law enforcement's made a mistake or hasn't done things exactly right. Uh, but it's, it's critical for folks to understand that one bad apple doesn't ruin an orchard. 99.9% .9 of the folks serving in these roles of first responders do so at too little pay, at great anxiety. And when they kiss their spouse goodbye in the morning, they don't know if they're coming back or not. And uh, I think this bill, it's time has come. We have a number of strong sponsors on this, and that we're growing support for this bill. And as I said, this isn't a wide open death penalty. This is very specific, very narrow. I pray will never be used, but it's a tool that we need to have in our arsenal to make it clear with a bold, strong statement across West Virginia and our country that if you want to target first responders in the line of duty, you better not do it in West Virginia. Matt Miller. Mike, you mentioned strong sponsors. What is the general support that you see for this bill as you talk with other legislators? Uh, do you feel like this is going in the direction that it could pass? Yeah, I think we have, you know, this is one thing. When you start talking about legislation, it's, you know, watching the sausage being made is not the most beautiful thing in the world. 
Uh, but I actually believe we have a strong shot of passing this. Keep in mind, uh, when I introduced last year a bill to double the uh, the inspection sticker on vehicles the to, from one year to two years, I was told there's no chance it will pass. When I moved to try to regulate Delta 8, Delta 10 at these vape shops across West Virginia, the synthetic, uh, the s- synthetic drugs that our kids were buying across the state, I was told it had no chance to pass. Both those bills passed by almost unanimous margins. And so I'm just a big believer in working and uh, spending my time here, not hanging out at dinners or events, but I work legislators one-on-one. And what I'm hearing from folks across West Virginia is that they support this action. And I think that has a big impact on legislators. And I'm getting text messages from folks I don't know that say, me and my family support this legislation. And so I would encourage your listeners, if they support this type of action, a very limited, reserved, very clear use of the death penalty, hopefully never used, but it needs to be in the arsenal. If they support that, I encourage them, call your legislator, your state senator, your House of Delegate member, and let them know. Uh, I'll tell you, a dozen calls, 20 calls, it can have a huge impact. And I encourage folks to, to pick up the phone, send a text, send an email, and let your legislator know where you stand on this. We support first responders in West Virginia, and I think it would help morale. And we're at a point where morale is tough with respect to first responders across West Virginia, recruiting and retaining new officers, uh, new firemen, uh, new EMS workers is perhaps the greatest challenge we've ever seen uh, for these jobs in West Virginia. And we need to make sure we, we make the workplace as safe as we can for all those folks serving us every day. Matt, before you continue real mm-hmm. quickly, just uh, got notification. Jefferson County government offices have moved from a delayed opening today to now being closed. Uh, so is the Jefferson County court system, too, closed for the rest of the day today. Go ahead, Matt. Mike, back to the, the death penalty. And one of the arguments that we often hear against it is that it actually costs more to deal with a person who is in that situation where they've been sentenced to death because of all of the appeal processes and so forth than it would to actually incarcerate that person for even the remainder of their lives. Is that a part of this bill in any way as far as what those appeals processes would be? And is it any different when you're dealing with first responders who most of the time those officers will have some kind of on-person or at least on-vehicle video that, that may make the case a little easier than uh, an an ordinary case where maybe you're relying solely on witnesses or circumstantial evidence? So I think it's a great question, and the cost question is the one that most often gets brought up. First and foremost, I would say, what cost is there to preserve the lives of our our first responders? Uh, Sergeant Corey Maynard, and, and I guess as I've gotten older in life, I realize life is really about those special moments that day you see your daughter go to the prom, uh, when you see the birth of your grandchild, uh, when you propose to your wife that those anniversaries, Christmas morning, as you see your grandkids get up and the excitement around the tree. Sergeant Corey Maynard, who was ambushed in the line of duty, will never get any of those special moments again. His family will never be able to share in any of those special moments again. And so I understand the cost factor, but we have taken that into consideration. There's a couple points on this one. The bill has been written in such a way, and me being a a lawyer, somebody who's worked at the federal level, I I studied all 50 states in terms of the regimes that were in place. And I put together the simplest bill possible uh, that is constitutional, that will pass constitutional muster if it's challenged. But I think a couple points on this one In the case of Sergeant Corey Maynard's uh, ambushing and murder in the line of duty, that defendant is now uh, pending trial. It will be a very, very expensive trial. I suspect that if he were facing the death penalty, his counsel, and he would be willing to cut a deal pretty quick, saving us the expense of a very lengthy, expensive trial in lieu of not getting the death penalty, but in exchange getting life behind bars without parole. Second point is that we do provide 
a process here where the aggravating circumstance under this bill is the murder of a first responder in the line of duty. Pretty easy to tie those things together. The jury in any one of these cases will make the determination as to whether based on the circumstances uh, with respect to the individual case that the death penalty applies. Beyond that, the judge then will review to make sure from a legal standpoint the death penalty should, be, should, should apply. And then it immediately goes to the West Virginia State Supreme Court for the court to take a quick determination uh, within 10 days as to whether the death penalty should apply. And there are a number of mitigating circumstances, whether it's the competency of the defendant and a number of other, whether the defendant is 17 years old or younger. So we've tried to take into account all those issues that might be a concern. Uh, this bill will pass constitutional muster. The fentanyl bill, I support it. It's more complex. It's more difficult because, as you know, then you have to get into when you talk about fentanyl, the power, the, the, the potency, the quality, how do you measure it, uh, but for or most likely did the fentanyl lead to death. Th those are harder things to prove. But my bill, very, very simple, and we'll send a bold statement to folks across the state of West Virginia, across the country, as to our support of law enforcement. And so I know that was a long answer, but, yeah, we've taken those things into consideration. I don't believe this will increase cost, uh, but if it did, I think it's a worthy cost for us to bear to make it clear that Sergeant Corey Maynard, Abe Bain, Caden Spessert, Deputy Sheriff Baker out of Nicholas County, uh, Patrolman Cassie Johnson in Charleston, uh, that they matter, their lives are worth more than the relative increase in the cost of these prosecutions, and that we, the people of West Virginia, are willing to go to bat to make sure these first responders are safe in the line of duty as they serve us. Let me play devil's advocate one more time. Uh, just because we hear these types of arguments on a regular basis, there are not only cost issues, but others who might not argue the cost tend to argue death penalty doesn't deter a criminal. And when you look at first responder cases, sometimes we even see where a, a criminal may have a death wish themselves and say, you know, that, that they may not be willing to commit suicide, but we'll do it by police. We hear that term, suicide by police. They'll they'll try to force a situation where they get taken out. Uh, is that a concern in any way that, you know, even with this bill passing, will it deter some of those incidences that our first responders face? So I'd make two points to that. I don't know that we can protect from every instance, instance of suicide by police or those folks who who want to die at the hand of police officers. But there are two reasons I think this bill is important. One is deterrence, but the other is justice. And so uh, I do believe this is a reasonable deterrent. Perfect, of course not. But certainly the deterrence factor is greater than it is today. And then I talk about justice. There needs to be some level of justice in these cases. Sergeant Corey Maynard's family deserves justice. You know, he was brutally ambushed in the line of duty. And then it was even worse when the guy took the butt of his rifle and went over and assaulted him even further. Uh, it was clear the intention, premeditated in this case, justice, not vengeance, justice demands that we take these types of actions. And so I think it's both deterrence and justice. Uh, but as I said before, I crafted this very narrowly only to cover first responders. I know that there are other classifications I would support, uh, child rape, uh, terrorists. Uh, but I think it's important we take a first step, make sure this works. And it seemed to me the most reasonable, prudent approach was to make sure we first focus on protecting our first responders, give ourselves some time to evaluate, to tweak, to make it better, uh, to see whether it works at all. Uh, but uh, there's no certainty this is, a, is the perfect approach. But I think it's the right approach to send a big statement of 
our support for first responders. And first responders, again, includes police officers as well as firefighters, EMS. We've heard of cases of uh, arson where someone sets a fire simply to fire on uh, the, those firefighters that come to, to take care of that fire, that the first responders incorporates that entire uh, group of people. I think it's important we do that. You know, arson is one of it, – it, it's, it's interesting because as U.S. attorney, and it's tragic – as U.S. Attorney, I was very aggressive in prosecuting arson cases because they do lead to the death of first responders. Just because you own a building and you have an insurance policy, you have no right to set a fire to it in which our first responders, our firemen, uh, EMS, somebody could be injured or killed in putting that fire out or because they're, in proximate, uh, they're approximately close to where that fire has been set. Uh, I think it's important that we'll look at these on a case-by-case basis. And uh, I think in the case of Sergeant Corey Mater, no question the death penalty would apply. In the case of an arson, I think you've got to look at each one of these cases individually uh, based on the circumstances. Uh, but uh, those arsonists out there, uh, when a fireman is killed in the line of duty and no longer has the ability to go home to his family, it was entirely foreseeable when that fire was set that that fireman or a fire person could die in the line of duty. Senator Mike Stewart, our guest here on the program. Uh, Mike, I think it's probably safe to say most, if not all, of our audience agrees that there should be severe and harsh penalties for those who commit violent crimes, especially those who commit those violent crimes uh, against first responders. Uh, From Attorney Joe Ferretti, who also acts as a co-host on this program on occasion, uh, he has this concern. Death penalty is an interesting subject for our state. We did have one of the more egregious state crime lab scandals in the country with innocent folks sitting in jail for years and millions paid in civil settlements. And this is one of the bigger concerns with the enactment of capital punishment, which is there's no going back once it's enacted if you got the wrong person. And he cites the state crime lab scandals from the past as another concern lumped in with that, too. Uh, Your thoughts on that? So things have changed a lot since 1965. And I understand the challenges and the egregious nature of those cases. And uh, those are to be condemned, and it should never happen again. But we've had a lot of advancements. I mean, my goodness, when these mistakes were made, these, these incredibly egregious, uh, terrible uh, actions were taken, we didn't have the Internet. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have any of the technology. You couldn't DNA test. Uh, it, it's remarkable where we've advanced to. Uh, in this day and age. And so hopefully we learn from the past, but we can't live our lives in fear of repeating mistakes so we just don't do things. We need to reenact it, learn from those past experiences, build in checks and balances that take into consideration what we've learned from those cases and do it better. And so I don't think it's a reasonable argument that because it was so messed up before, we can't do it again. Uh, I just don't believe that. I think we've learned from those experiences, and I think we can build it better moving forward. I know I need to let you go because you're moving uh, over toward uh, caucus right now. I think the Senate caucus is at 830 now. So, Mike, thanks so much for your time this morning. The final word is yours if you want it. Well, makewvgreatagain.com. Makewvgreatagain.com. I urge you to go there. I need help in this race for attorney general. I've had some really, really good bills in support of law enforcement, whether it's the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network bill that just passed the Senate or felony warrants being indexed with the NCIC system. There are just a bunch of areas where I'll be very, very useful to the people of West Virginia. But makewvgreatagain.com is my website. And uh, please go there. I need your help. I'm the underfunded, hardest working candidate you'll ever see. Mike, thanks so much for your time this morning. Good luck to you. Thank you.